So welcome to the Gear Scout Podcast. I'm your host, Christian Lowe, and with me, as always, is my good buddy, Chris Cleary, the co-host of the Gear Scout Podcast. And the cool thing about this is, I mean, you guys probably realize this, this is our premiere episode, our first episode ever of the Gear Scout Podcast. Yes, I know, another podcast, but you know what? This one's different. Why? Because we're going to be talking tactical shit, guys. Because this is the kind of stuff you want to talk about all the time, but you just really don't have anyone else to talk to about it, right? Well, you got us now, right, Chris? You're going to listen to us wax poetically about things we know something about. That's right. That's right. No, I, I was going to say not something about as to be the definitive scholars in the subject. Exactly. Something about question mark, which is we know enough to be dangerous, but we think we know as much as any other nut. Exactly. Out there. Not a exactly. Snake eater, you right. know. Hardcore killer, two to the chest, one of right. the head guys. That's right. Although we've intermingled with the, that community. That's right. We, we don't kick indoors, but we kind of think we might like to if the zombie apocalypse goes down. Yes. I think <laughs> we're better than the average citizen if that scenario should present itself. I think you and I will do okay. That's what I keep telling myself, Chris. And we're praying for that scenario every day just to use half the shit that we bought. Exactly. Whatever it's, happened. It's, to the zombie-themed everything. Like, that was the heyday of all of this. And who doesn't love that? And who, just like every kid who saw... Uh, um, Red Dawn. Red Dawn, thank you. Oh, That's my God. With. Who it's a life changer. Who attack back in the 80s? Who doesn't want the zombies to attack today? You know what, Chris? I think that you, you've just raised a really good point. I think we need to definitely put into our uh, podcast planning document a entire episode about how red dawn changed our lives a that definitely dates us so we may lose a bunch of uh listeners because of this right it shows how goddamn old we are but you know it was a seminal movie that really solidified in both of us our sort of tactical acumen and desire to be ready for the soviet cuban invasion of and, Colorado. And it, look at and to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not sure if I'm interested in talking to anyone who's not familiar with that movie. You have a really good point. Because we're talking Chris. To, huh? You have a really good point. I, I mean, look at anybody who doesn't know what Red Dawn is shouldn't be listening to this podcast in the first place. Because we're talking to a particular demographic, we're talking to our age group, we're talking to guys who are armchair quarterbacks. We're talking to guys who are waiting for the world to come to an end, and they think they're going to be the saviors of mankind. And I think we all realize what's going to happen if that scenario should present itself. We're all in a lot of trouble. We're Nonetheless, completely we'll, fucked. We'll look good while we're doing it. I will say that. Exactly, Chris. Thank you very much for that brilliant introduction. I think it sets the stage for what we hope will be a long and storied season and lifespan of the gear scout podcast i predict 12 episodes max uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll see your 12 episodes all right and on how long we talk you know 14 15 we'll see i think it's great all right so i just want to know you know what 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 you've been up to what's uh what's going on in your life you know uh anything you know interesting and fun to uh tell everyone about what's going on and cp cleary's uh tactical Existence. Sure. Well, listen, you know, as it pertains to this uh, genre, which is why you and I seem to have found each other in the dark at some point. Right. Uh, and and kindred spirits eventually align. Um, you know, everybody listening to this show has lives, has kids, has jobs, has wants, needs and desires. Uh, like anybody else, I don't get to my shooting sports as often as I would like. Um, I go down and I fight my son for the Xbox and he says I can't use it. I, I I tuck my tails between my legs and I go over and I open my gun safe and I look in there and I see what I got and what I want and what I have and probably what I have too much of. Uh, and every once in a while I get to the range. Uh, you and I were at the range not too long ago, uh, which was a good time. We had the range all to ourselves and uh, been able to kind of plink uh, unsupervised in a variety of different things that we were doing. I, I quite enjoyed that and it's been... Yeah, actually, it was too long since we'd gotten out to the range, and it's—I already feel remiss. It's been too long since that day. 
Uh, but other than work, kids, sports, soccer, baseball, flag football, kids back to school, um, life in this world is to, a variety of trying to trying to. I like to say you do what you have to do so you can do what you want to do. And if I if I rack up enough brownie points with with baseball and soccer and work and uh, keeping the wife happy, then I get to do what I want to do, which is you and I get to go off and spend a day, half a day at the range, zombie weekends. And that's what I'm gearing up for. That's what yeah. I'm hoping. That, I mean, I totally get it. You know, uh, for, for me, you know, this is a busy time of year. We're September, October. You know, for many of you who might not know this, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a digital director at Military Times. Gear Scout is part of the Military Times family. Um, and right now is a very busy time of year. A lot of um, industry shows, uh, Air Force Association. Uh, we've got Modern Day Marine coming up. Uh, and we have, of course, uh, AUSA, the Association of the U.S. Army show, which is a really, really big show. And, and our, you know, newspapers and our digital, you know, uh, properties play, play a large role in that. And and, uh, you know, I have to kind of help and support that. Um, it also is a, a great time because we learn a lot. Uh, you know, there's a, a big part of our organization that covers like the big programs like tanks and planes and ships and all that stuff. And what we do on the Gear Scout side is we really zero in on really the, uh, you know, our motto at Gear Scout is if you wear it or carry it, we cover it, right? So it really is down to the, to the boots on the ground and what those people in the, in the Marine Corps, in the Army, in uh, the shooter side of the Air Force uh, are doing and, and what new gear is coming out for them. So that's a big part. I did end up uh, eking out um, <laughs> a little bit of time at the range. Uh, I snuck uh, out there uh, before work uh, last week. I really will get to this later in the, in the uh, Killing Zombies segment, but I'd made a modification with my primary uh, AR that I use for competitions, and I wanted to make sure that it was shooting right uh, and also one of the things I noticed when we were out uh, shooting at, uh, at our range uh, together, do some practice for the upcoming match, uh, is that, you know, I've been, I don't know about uh, how big the listeners are in Red Dot Optics, but, and, and, and we, sh later on, a, a couple episodes down the road, we'll be talking a little bit more about Red Dots on handguns, but I have one on a handgun and it was registering a little bit off. So I had to go back uh, to the range and make sure that everything was squared away. So I did. But the funny thing was, it was one of those like, you know, we're in the D.C. area and it got really, really wicked hot uh, a couple days last week. And it, I got out there and it was like nine in the morning. And I'm telling you, within five minutes, I was dripping with sweat. And of course, I had to go to the office after that. So I, 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 I really truncated my, my trip to the range and like, just got everything sighted in, made sure that I found the right length of pull with uh, some modifications I did with my rifle, and that was it. Uh, I did go out and, and do a little hunting um, on Saturday afternoon. It's dove season around here, so I like to go out there with my dog and see if I can drop a couple birds. Uh, no luck this time. A couple couple shots, but, but not a lot flying. Um, but that's, you know... Gearing up really for the show season, uh, and we'll have a lot of news about that uh, in, in, in episodes uh, coming up, but um, that's kind of what's been going on in our world. So, Chris. Yes. Now it's time to talk about the news side of things. Uh, you know, I don't know what you have on your agenda, but the big news most recently was new movement from the United States Army on the Next Generation Squad Weapon Program. Now, for those of you out there who like maybe have heard a little bit about this but don't know the specifics, essentially about a year ago, two years ago maybe, the Army started looking into how it would replace the M4 and the squad automatic weapon, the M249, uh, with a new automatic rifle slash machine gun and a new rifle slash carbine with a whole new round, okay? It will fire a new round, not the 5.56, not the 7.62, but a 6.8. And the main reason for this is 
that threat assessments, experience in Afghanistan, all this kind of stuff has shown army leaders that the 556 is not effective against the prospective threat. So a, AKA China and Russia wearing body armor at distances beyond 300 yards, okay? So the, yet again, the army's involved in another program to replace the M4, but my sources are telling me that this time is different, that the army's serious about this, and they just recently issued a, uh, a release saying that they had down-selected from four companies to three on the program. Those three companies are General Dynamics, who is teamed up with, of all companies, Beretta. I don't understand that. And, and I know, right? And another company uh, that makes the, the round itself, uh, which will be a polymer-cased round. Uh, and then... The second company is uh, Textron. Textron's been uh, developing a, a weapon over many decades, a couple decades, maybe a, a decade and a half, called the um, Lightweight Small Arms Technology LSAT program. Uh, it's basically a case telescope round. It's a plastic round with a bullet embedded in the inside and powder, and it's supposed to be it's much lighter weight. It's very much a science project. And then the third company, uh, is Sig Sauer. Um, they have a new rifle and a new uh, machine gun, uh, automatic rifles, what the Army's calling it, uh, firing a 6.8 round. The, um, the rifle is based on the MCX platform, essentially, um, with some modifications. And the fourth company that got uh, kicked out of the competition, interestingly, and was the odds-on favorite to actually go and win this program was uh, FN uh, America, so Fabrique Nationale FN. They make most of, uh, right now, the Army's M4s, uh, but they, uh, I heard from, from some of my sources who are kind of tapped into this stuff, were going to submit a variation of the SCAR, and um, they uh, ended up getting nudged out of the competition and it's those last three so that's big news and uh it does seem that this is going to go forward and this is going to happen so you know what i think is interesting about this debate as a you know so as a navy guy who did a couple deployments to iraq who worked with lots of marines who's been you know stationed with a lot of army guys this debate between when the m4 carbine you know, 16 inch barrel, as opposed to the Marine Corps going to, I might get this wrong, the M16 and A2 or A3 with a 20 inch barrel. The Marines philosophy was always about engaging yards out 300 yards. The Army seemed to sort of acknowledge that it's target set when you looked at urban operations inside of, you know, city like environments. You know, those guys were saying, you know, if you looked at engagements in Iraq, you were never engaging anything beyond maybe even 100 yards. Right. So the idea that the army is acknowledging that the you know, wars of the future, the Russians, the Chinese going back to these, you know, open terrain battles where, you know, you're trying to engage yards at, you know, out beyond 600 meters, potentially wearing body armor. To me, that that, that is just an, an acknowledgement of understanding the wars of the future. Um you know, and even, you know, and if you look at it, where I think even stuff has devolved to in uh, Afghanistan, you know, I know you're a fan of the uh, the SCAR platforms. I know you have a SCAR heavy. I have a lot of friends in the teams who shoot SCARs, particularly, you know, some of the, like, you know, the SCAR heavy. That's that sort of reach out and get you weapon that a squad would be carrying with them. And I know in the SEAL community, that's sort of their, uh, you know, designated markman's weapon, it, you know, to one degree or another. But the, but that's always been using, you know, a 308 round. Um, the idea that they're going to this, you know, six, eight rounds, something in the middle, that, that's really interesting to me. And the fact that the the Army uh, and potentially the Marine Corps will be investing in a round uh, that they'll, you know, ultimately be making thousands and thousands and thousands of. It would be, you know, you and I as, you know, civilian gun guys. Um, I'll be really interested to see that thing eventually make its way over to the civilian market and get a chance to, you know, plink around with one. Yeah, I mean, they call it the intermediate cartridge um and th they've been testing one down at uh benning for many years uh 
I got some folks who work at different firearms companies and, and work on the military side at those firearms companies and who also came out of uh, the military. And so they, they, you know, they've followed developments with this. I think it's called like the 276 USA. Someone in the, someone in the, um, in the comments probably should correct us, but um, they developed a round down at Benning uh, and basically the 6.8 round is a, is like a 270 Winchester or something, right? So it's, I think, I know that the, that the um, SIG version is a 6.8 by 51, I think. I'm pretty sure it's a by 51. So isn't that what the AK round uh, is? AK is, is 7.62 by 39. All right. The 308 Winchester is 7.62 by 51. So okay. if it's a 51 round... You're, it's a smaller bullet with a similar cartridge. Yeah, like right, right, right. So, in Sarcom, yeah. So a lot of powder behind it, you know, yeah. giving it a lot of um, of muzzle velocity. Uh, I'll be interested to see some of those uh, specifications have been, you know, under wraps. Uh, I have not. I've, I've got. I've not gotten anyone in industry to give me any kind of specs. Um, but I, I have heard that. You know, the analogy is it's like trying to fire an M1 tank round from your shoulder. Uh, so these yeah. companies are trying to mitigate the potential recoil. And, you know, kind of speaking to what you were saying, the other issue is weight. So this is going to be a bigger round, which means I don't know that we're going to see 30 round magazines. Uh, and so it's been, it's been incumbent upon the developers of these prototypes to develop rounds that are lighter so that you're not adding weight to the soldier. I mean, we all know, and to the Marine or the SEAL or whomever, right? We all know that carrying the 7.62 rounds, they are heavy and those magazines are smaller uh, because of the weight, because of the size of the bullet and all of that, right? So this is an intermediate cartridge. And so that means how are you going to deliver, you know, similar or the same amount of firepower without a major weight penalty um, and that's why these companies are one company is developing a polymer cased ammunition. Uh, Sig Sauer has a blended metal um, uh, uh, cartridge, so it's uh, a I think it's steel and brass uh, um, cartridge. And you know the case telescope one from Textron is you know it's almost like picture if you haven't seen it, you can Google it, and we'll put some links in the show notes. But picture like a like almost like a shotgun slug, okay? So the bullet is embedded in a kind of a, 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 a um, you know, a shell, like a shotgun shell, uh, um, where so the bullet the doesn't protrude. is what you're saying. It's yeah, the bullet the doesn't protrude from okay. the end of the, of, the, um, of the shell, essentially, and so, or the case. So three different approaches. Um, I, I actually sat through a, a very interesting lecture by the company that is making the round for the uh, General Dynamics version. This is the one with a polymer, all polymer case. Um, I think it does have a brass like seat, you know, so uh, where the primer goes in and all that stuff to, to be able to withstand the the uh, rigors of you know being pulled from a magazine, put into the the carrier, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but they say they claim that that these uh, polymer cases can 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 handle the pressure and all that kind of stuff. I am super psyched about this. There is no doubt, and I'm sure your experience in the in the active military, particularly with JSOC units, you know you, you would um, agree with this. There's been a lot of criticism about the 556 five, round. No joke. You and I shoot a lot of 556 five, 223 two, rounds. It's a small bullet, man. It is not that's a varmint killer. That is not a man killing bullet. I'm sorry. There's just no evidence of that. And yeah, there's evidence that it that it can knock down a target, but it it, it ain't a hunting round. Let me put it that way, right? And yeah. so, you know, you'll hear all lots of crusty gunnery sergeants and you know, marksmanship instructors say it's all about shot placement. Well, yeah, you can kill someone with a 22 if you, sh if you, sh you know, target them in the right place. But this, I, I think, is really a, a big step in uh, increasing, you know, ground pounders lethality out to long ranges. And you also raise one last point, and I swear to God, I'll shut up after this. 
it really is Afghanistan that taught guys this. Iraq was an urban fight. Look, a 7.62 works just fine in urban environments. In fact, that round will punch through walls. You know, the AK-47 punches through that crappy, you know, mud brick bullshit that's over there in Iraq. Um, so a bigger round will punch through walls in an urban environment. And in a non-urban environment like Afghanistan, it will reach out to greater ranges, engaging, you know, enemy who are engaging us with you know 762 by 54R and all that kind of stuff, right? You know from PKMs and wow. and and knock through them. So I, I think it's a huge step forward, and I'm I'm glad to see that this is this is moving. Yeah, and it keeps the industry making new stuff. So that's the other thing, right? Never stop innovating. So uh, you know, God bless them, right? New round, new thing, new innovation. We'll see where it goes. See when the army buys their 1.5 million rounds to start messing around with and. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to kind of see this one run its run run the traps. Well, you raise a good point on that one too, Chris, and this is something else that the listeners might not really totally be aware of is this is really one of the I I never like to say the first time, but one of the first times that basically the 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 army gave a loose spec and uh said they want it in this uh caliber, but how you got there was up to you. And that's why to industry. And they want to learn from industry what is possible. What are the trade-offs that they have to have between the lethality of a 6.8 and maybe the trade-offs they have to have for weight, right? Does that, you know, what does that mean? How, what, what are all the different factors in there? And I think, you know, we, we're not, this is, this is a show where we are not going to get into politics. But one of the things that really changed the industry was the, um, the end of the assault weapons ban uh, in 2004 because that let industry loose to develop new products for a much larger market than the U.S. military, the civilian market. And so there's been a lot of innovation in industry. And uh, this program right here is really kind of, you know, um, the, the, the bleeding edge of that innovation. So, yep. It's exciting. Okay. For our next segment, we're going to talk about things that we like to, that we have to kind of hide under the rug from uh, our current uh, significant others because why we're a little bit addicted to this stuff. We buy guns, we buy ammo, we buy kit, we buy threads uh, that are ridiculous and that our wife will give us total crap about, but that, you know what, at the end of the day, we just simply can't live about. Why? Because we live by the axiom that an ounce of image is worth a pound of performance. So if you look good, you're probably going to shoot good. And even if you don't shoot good, you look good shooting bad, right? So uh, up on the list here, I will go first on this one because I just went a little hog wild at 5.11. They've got a bunch of new stuff coming out. Look, I love 5.11. i got to be honest with you. I think in the last five years, they have really turned the corner uh, from, you know, stock you know, fat police guy stuff to, you know what I mean? Like to oh, really serious. cool looking stuff. They've got the head of that company. Fits uh, fat. Say again. You said cool looking stuff that fits fat people. <laughs> well, they've got something for everyone, Chris. Yes, the, they do. The, the guy who runs the company now and who, and who for a while was running their, their, you know, kind of clothing division is a really smart guy. He comes from a, from a, uh, you know, like a fashion design background and a material, you know, like, you know, the, I won't call it material science, but the stuff that goes into clothing, he, he's very, very smart on all the different fabrics and all that kind of stuff. And 5.11's come out with some really neat stuff. Um, I, I got a pair of these, uh, of these, um, are they called the Norris sneakers or something? No, I didn't get any of those. I got, uh, some new kind of high tops that they've got, like tactical high tops. I got the Bra Bravo pant, the Capital pant. And then they also came out with some new range bags. So I'm testing out uh, the Range Master bag. Chris, you know that like I transport my ammo to, uh, to matches in a, one of those like sort of plastic polymer, you know, like Hello waterproof case. cases. Well, now I'm switching out to this Range Master bag and it's, uh, it's a cool piece of gear. And, and stay tuned to Gear Scout on our Instagram channel. Uh, it's at, um, you know, Instagram, it's at the Gear Scout. 
I'll have pictures of it and all that kind of stuff. But I'm always, I'm a big fan of tactical pants and I'm a big fan of like, you know, t-shirts and cool shirts and, and cool shoes and all that stuff that have like sort of a tactical lineage, but also look good. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of excited about all that stuff. And I've kind of had to hide it under the rug because my wife is basically at the point where it's like one in, one out. She's sick and tired of all the t-shirts and shirts and tactical pants I have. So I either have to hide them back in the, you know, with my hunting gear in the back of the closet, or I got to like ditch some pants so that it'll, I'll make room in my drawer for some new ones. So this is, uh, this, this is what I'm sneaking in. So I'm going to jump into the, the clothing pipeline here just for a second. I was going to talk to this one initially, but it just so happens as we're talking, I am wearing a grunt style t-shirt uh, and cruising through LinkedIn and Facebook I saw, you know, a grunt style thing and they had one that was specifically geared up for us Navy guys. And of course it says salty across the front. I like to think as a old Navy retired commander, I'm a salty guy. So I had to get that. Uh, that was kind of a sneak purchase from the wife, but you just can't like anything else. You just can't buy one. So when you go to the website, it's hard to just put one t-shirt in the bag. Uh, I think I got three. I Good. I that's right. They're a great company. I, I, I worked with, I worked with them some, uh, when I was at We're the Mighty, uh, they are a cool group of of, of folks. Uh, they make great. They've got great sense of humor. They really know how to how to kind of hit the nerve and hit the nail on the head on that stuff. Great, great guys. So, and what I will say is they uh, they come true to size. I'd say other like I wear a lot of Under Armour stuff, and I think that stuff runs a little bit small. So I went a little bit big on the order. I typically wear a two X. Uh, I went 3X just as a goof, and I'll buy a 3X as a big T-shirt, so it's way bigger than I needed. Um, so I'll say for anybody who's thinking about getting something at the uh, grunt style, you know, get what you typically buy. Don't go over like I did, uh, although it's super comfy, and I wear it to work out all the time now. They're super good T-shirts. But the thing that I was going to talk about that I really have to hide under the rug, and because we're blogging, I'm looking over my shoulder now to ensure my wife is not with an earshot. Hopefully she's going to get my son at baseball. Uh but the thing that I've been coveting that I've recently just got was the EOTech Voodoo one to six scope for uh, our three gun activities. Um, I was running a Bushnell one to four uh, throwdown, which again, great product, uh, but it just it, I wanted a little bit more zoom on it. Um, last year, when you and I were at the, the zombie match, there was a guy from EOTech out there, you know, showing me the Voodoo one, the Voodoo scope. I have to admit. Uh, I started a year ago, kind of fell in love with it, was hemming and hawing over a whole bunch of different kind of optics, you know, Vortex, um, you know, you name it, in the kind of the $1,000 price range. Uh, and this EOTech scope, I have to admit, I really, really like it. At the low range, at it, the, it, the one power, it's your traditional EO, for anybody who shoots an EOTech, it's tradi your traditional, you know, ring with your, you know, the, the, they have a couple different options for, the, for what you're looking at in the center of the ring and when you zoom in to six power what's in the center of the ring it looks like a dot or a very small crosshair uh at one power at six power blows up into again the version i got i think is the there's three models there's a there's one model that has basically a, a five five six reticle in the middle with drop compensators associated for i think for a 55 grain round then there's another one that has a seven six two setup and then of course there's one that just has a hash mark with a I believe it's a uh, MOA hashes on it. Um, but when you zoom into that, you get a really nice, you know, X pattern you're looking at. Uh, the illumination is great. The glass is great. Um, and for anybody, you know, kind of shooting the, uh, the three gun sports, I look at it. It works perfect. I'm a big fan of it. Didn't cost too much. Not the, not the least expensive, not the most expensive. Um, and I will hide it on my, uh, Daniel defense rifle that I'm, that I'm running it on. Um, until my wife eventually sees me running it, and then I'll have to explain how I got it and where it came from. So nobody rat me out in the meantime. She won't know the difference, dude. Come on. You say, oh, that's just the one I had on my other rifle. It's just, I just switch them back and forth. Yeah, I'd like to think that's the truth, but I don't, I don't, I don't know if I can get away with that. All right, so tell point. me a little bit about that reticle. Like, I, I love, uh, I, you know, I haven't run my rifle with the EOTech on it in a long time. That's sort of on my home defense gun, but like, I really do like that EOTech reticle in the, in the, in the traditional holographic site. It, yeah. Is that so, what you're talking about with this thing? Yeah. So one of the, so it's really good with quick acquisition when you got it, you know, whatever, you know, the, 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 
the, the site is designed to be zeroed at 50 and 200. So, you know, you zero at 50. Now, theoretically, again, for those people on the blog that are familiar with the site, if you look at the hash mark at the, what would be the six o'clock position, theoretically that's zeroed. If you've got the rifle zeroed at 50 yards, that bottom hash mark is zeroed at seven yards. So think anything that would be CQB or anything that's right in your grill. Well, you know, Christian, you and I realized that we were out shooting it the other day. We, I was trying to use that bottom hash mark for a zero, and it really wasn't true to you – know, maybe I've got it set up wrong. I'd like to talk to the EOTech guys about this. But aiming at the bottom hash mark at targets inside of seven meters, and if you were aiming you – know, the rounds were all coming in high. Really, to be honest with you, it was still point blank, um, which I guess gets into the theory of zeroing an optic at, at 50 and 200 because what somebody calls that is basically point, zero, point blank range. So if you've got that optic zeroed at 50 yards and you and I for the zombie match next week will be shooting targets out to 200, potentially out to 300, for all intents and purposes, you don't really need to put any drop compensation for targets from zero to 300. You can kind of just aim and shoot. You might want to aim an inch high, maybe aim a little high on the targets for things a little further out. But for inside what you'd see, you know, what, what, battle zero, right? Army guys battle zero the rifles to 300 yards which is basically makes anything you're shooting at point, almost point blank from zero to 300 yards. If you want to shoot a six inch plate or a 12 inch steel plate anywhere within that range point and shoot, you know, you don't really have to worry about windage or real drop compensation at that. What I will say is that rifle for that most part holds true to that. Again, I got it zero to 50. I was out clicking steel between 50 and 300 and, you know, point and shoot and I'm hitting a 12 inch plate you know, no problem. So I think for our zombie match, we're going out to shoot, uh, next month. I think the farthest target we shoot at is maybe 200 yards. If I remember correctly. Um, and I think that that optic is perfect for it. And, uh, you know, to say, you know, zooming in at six power at two or 300 yards, six power is more than enough to hit, uh, you know, call it a man sized target. Uh, so I love the thing. Again, I'm glad I bought it. Uh, big fan. Doesn't have the warranty of the guys that you know. Vortex Optics, amazing warranty. I just wasn't crazy with some of the the um, the reticles inside those guns. I like the EOTech one. It's working for me. Happy with it. Can't wait to shoot it. Design to match. You know, that's a perfect segue, Chris, uh, to our next segment, which is training for zombies. So. You know, this is the, the first episode of the podcast, so it's probably good to, for a little background. You know, Chris and I uh, compete, uh, uh, you know, not a ton, but we compete at least once a month, uh, either IDPA, USPSA, three gun or two gun. That That's kind of what we veer towards. And every year uh, we attend the uh, HESCO Inv Invitational three gun match in zombie invitational three gun match in West Virginia. It's a two day match. It's really challenging, really fun. It's a great time. Uh, great shooters, really fun shooters. Um, you know, never had a, a bad experience with any of them. Great courses, uh, really challenging stages. Uh, one of the things you are required to bring is uh, a long knife of some sort because you do, uh, there is a stage where you have to uh, slash the face of a zombie or stick that knife in, in the zombie's head. Um, <clears throat> but we, we tend to, like at least in this time of year, we're, we're training for that, we're preparing for that. But really at the end of the day, uh, every match we do, every time we go out and shoot, we're just, you know, honing our skills for when the shit hits the fan and we got to start dropping zombies coming after our uh after our family and our house kind of deal so in the training for zombies segment we like to talk about you know some tools we're using maybe some new techniques we've learned some trips to the range where we did some drills that we tried something like that and you know both chris and i have exposure uh to a lot of different um, techniques and new train trainers, new schools, that kind of thing. And so we'll use this segment to kind of go over, you know, some of the things we're seeing in the market, some of the things we've experienced, some of the things that might help you uh, be a better, safer, more accurate shooter and, and, and look cool doing it. So 
Chris, talk to me a little bit about what you've been doing lately or any tools you've been using for, uh, to train for the zombie apocalypse. I'll do two things. One is uh, a friend of mine put me onto the JP rifle buffer spring. Okay, talk to me. If any guys are familiar, all right, so we've all shot AR platforms. We're all familiar with the, the traditional buffer spring, uh, I'll call it rattleness, or I can't think of the word, but I know everybody that's shot an AR rifle has heard, you know, you pull the, the, the sound of the buffer going back to the buffer tube and kind of the rattleness of the spring, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, JP Rifle introduced this buffer spring, which is the only way to say it. It's more of a piston that goes in the back in your buffer tube as opposed to a traditional buffer and spring. And it really takes all that spring noise out of it. It takes all that clangy sound that's by your ear as it rests against the, uh, you know, your stock out of the stock. And it's just a, a solider feel to the buffer spring being fired. I'm not, I don't know if it actually has anything to do with performance, but it definitely feels the rifle feels a little more solid. You don't hear as much of that, you know, again, the, 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 the rattleness, I, I, I can't describe it any better, but I all know everybody who's listening to this knows exactly what I'm talking about with that buffer string going back. Um, so I threw that in the rifle runs really great. It's a lot quieter. Um, and it, the rifle just feels a little more solid. Uh, the other thing as it pertains to killing zombies, and this is going to be a one-off and you guys are all going to laugh at me when I say this, but it took my 11 year old daughter to the, uh, uh, the Renaissance festival a couple weeks ago. And at the Renaissance festival, there's lots of knife throwing stations. Um, my 11 year old daughter loved throwing knives. So, uh, to support that, cause I thought it was also cool. We of course went and bought knives for throwing and I bought a bunch of boards and I set up a throwing knife range in our driveway. Um, and throw, I have yet to say that there's nothing more satisfying than throwing a knife and having it stick and hearing that thwack of a knife sticking in the board. <laughs> there is a huge piece of me that wants to take these throwing knives to the zombie apocalypse. And when we have to get the, the pumpkins, I so badly want to throw a throwing knife and see if I can get a throwing knife. Because you know the good thing with a pumpkin is you don't even have to hit it right with the point. A, you can throw a knife hard enough, it'll go into the pumpkin, it doesn't matter how it hits it. So we could end up looking like badass ninjas throwing knives at pumpkins um, with very little training. I don't know, I, I, I know this is a gun thing, I'm, I'm doing a call out to throwing knives. For Are you kidding me? This is perfect, you, you, you watch John Wick? You know, like he was throwing knives and doing swords like nobody's business, like like the Seven Samurai. And and for those of you who don't don't, the the reference to the pumpkins is uh, at the at the zombie match that they simulate the zombie's head with a, a pumpkin. So so that when you when when the when the contestants go through and and do their knife work on the quote zombie head end quote it's it's actually a pumpkin head so well that's what he's talking yeah. about and, look, and you can go to uh i think i was at bass pro i think it's smith and wesson that makes a six set throwing knife they cost 30 bucks and i'll tell you what if you got a place in your yard to use them you will all be addicted to throwing knives into a board there's nothing cooler once you found your range look there's a, there's a trick to it i'm not gonna lie to you, you gotta watch youtube and figure out the trick to it <laughs> But once you've found your distance and when you've got your thing and your wife comes out and watch you throw six knives into the board and it, they all stick, it's awesome. So, so Chris, you realize, though, that this is not that far off from, uh, from throwing stars. All right. First of all, <laughs> throwing stars are for losers because <laughs> anybody can throw a star into a board. It's <laughs> not easy. But once you get it, once you're rocking it, Again, I don't care what anybody says. There is nothing more satisfying than throwing a knife and having it stick into the wood, especially if you can do it three or four times in a row. All right, fair enough. It le just promise me that you're not going to bring your bow staff. Okay, so for my <laughs> so for my uh, training for zombies, look, I alluded to this earlier. My primary competition rifle. It's my favorite rifle. It's uh, it's it's like a it's like a Toyota Land Cruiser of ARs is my Sig Sauer MCX Virtus. I love that thing. It's indestructible. I don't think I've ever cleaned it. 
Uh, it's a piston gun, so it'll run for miles. I love it. What I don't like about it is I don't like the stock. Uh, it is too bony for me. Um, and particularly with a long match where you're mixing up long range and short range, I really, really like to have a little bit more of a cheek weld on my uh, rifle. So, and interestingly, uh, I made the rifle more compliant for the state of Maryland. Maryland is a two feature state. For those of you who don't know what that means, it means that in Maryland, you can't have, uh, you can have one feature of a quote, assault rifle, quote, you know, end quote. I don't call them assault rifles, they do. Uh, um, in some states, you can't even have one feature, but one of those features is a folding stock. The SIG uh, MCX has a folding stock. Um, so what I did was I got a Thords and Customs um, adapter for the stock uh, for the MCX, and it just screws in a regular mil spec or or you know a regular spec, whatever the other one is. Um, uh, standard uh, buffer tube and you can put your regular AR stock on there. So I, you know, did a little bit of Franken building and uh, put a buffer tube uh, on the adapter and through my old uh, Magpul stock that has, uh, I forget what model it is, but it's got a really nice kind of uh, cheek weld on it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit fatter and, uh, and, and it's, I, I love it. It doesn't look as cool uh, as the MCX one, but I think for competitive purposes, uh, I think it'll be it'll be a lot more comfortable. You know, it's it's giving me. You noticed, uh, uh, Chris, when you and I shot uh, at the range a couple of weeks ago, that you know I I feel like I, I was having a little bit of issue with my uh, distance between the reticle of my of my rifle and you know where my eye was and where I was lined up, and so. I think this is going to help with that, uh, and and so I, I'm kind of psyched on that. Um, again, I'm I'm veering towards performance over image on this, which is not like me. Uh, you know, I tend to go with something that looks cooler, but I'm shooting all over the place and not hitting the target. Um, but this time, uh, I'm kind of psyched uh, that this thing's working. And one other quick thing, you motivated me to really think more about my shotgun reloads. Uh, so uh, I, did, uh. I did order some inert 12 gauge rounds, dummy rounds, uh, and I did some dry fire practice the other day um, trying to perfect my uh, reload speed. It was abysmal. Um, I was <laughs> reloading, I think I reloaded four rounds in seven seconds eight rounds in 14 seconds. That's like a stage killer right there. That is way too much time. Uh, but I did do some YouTube foo this past weekend, and I think I have a new kind of way to hold my shotgun and smash those shells in there um, that I, I need to practice to get better. What Have you been working a little bit on that shotgun like you said you would? No, so I, I have the I have the the four round put four rounds in your hand at a time. Not um, where you strip four rounds. You're not holding two and two. And I've learned to, and you feed one at a time. I would like to get a rig where you're you're grabbing either two at a time or four at a time, and then you're loading, you know, two and two. Yeah. Um, which itself, it's it's not easy. It looks easy. People who have practiced it right. for a long time make it look easy. It's not easy, which I would argue anybody going to uh, a rifle shotgun match that has not practiced at that, I mean practiced it to where they're good at it, your best option is either pulling one at a time off something or the thing that I do where you pull four from your, uh, like your Safari Lands four holster, but you're still just then jamming one at a time. Yeah, no, I, I, I was practicing two at a time. Uh, and, and, uh, that's the way, that's the way I do it. That's the way I'm, I'm going to train to do it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I really am paranoid about my thumb getting caught in there. It really sucks. And, yes. you know, particularly when you're loading a ton, 
I mean, I, fortunately, you and I both have uh, Mossberg Jam Pros, and I think, what do they have, nine or ten round magazines? So yeah. there's only a few stages where we're really forced to reload, and I do a lot of, like, stage counting and planning so that I don't have to reload. But, no, yeah. I'm, I'm doing two at a time, and, and, I, and I, I, think I, you know, I think I have a new way to do it where, I'm, where I'll be able to speed it up and really keep my fingers away from that um, gate. Uh, and also, I want to practice uh, a technique that, that I saw that where you grab four of them at a time, but you load two at a time. Yeah, That's what I was trying to say. Yeah, that, That's the trick. The trick is to grab four and two, and you load two and then load two. Right. I grab four, and I load one, two, three, four. Yeah. And that can be quick, too, depending on how good you are with it. But uh, I think the trick is, in shooting shotgun – it's stage management. So yeah. if you're ever moving from any stage to any other stage, you take that opportunity. You should be jamming rounds in um, while you're moving. And that's the trick. The, what kills you all the time in the shotgun stage is to get it to go to, go to bolt uh, lock back. And if the bolt locks back, unless you have that, what they call the cheater round, right? The, the guys Stage have, saver. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you can have that set up because that round goes in right away, then your bolt right. goes forward. Now you can jam it through the lead, the, the loading tray. Yep. That's where, look at, I'm not good enough at it. I've been caught that way. There's so many times we're doing the shotgun stage where I think I'm counting in my head and I'm like, oh, I'm good. And next yeah. thing you know, you get to your last round, the bolt's locked back, and you're like, ah, and you totally fuck it up. So um, not easy, and I'm not good at it, and I'd like to get better. We got to get better, better at the scatter gun, and I'm going to work on it as much as I can. You know what, Chris? That uh, we're about an hour here, and that that Absolutely. that'll close out the episode. I, I really appreciate your joining me and 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 doing this with with uh, with me and with Gear Scout and Military Times. I'm I'm excited about the future of this, and and you know we have a great time talking about this stuff, and you know. As, as, as my wife likes to say, it's just dudes chatting, dudes chatting tactical. Um, so I appreciate your, your, your doing this and joining us. Yeah, brother. Till next time. So I want to let everyone know, uh, look, we're going to be posting these episodes every Tuesday. Uh, as you know, this, this dropped on, on our premiere day on October 1st. Uh, also, be sure, we got a lot of other content at Gear Scout. Be sure to check out gearscout.militarytimes.com forward slash podcast. That's where you can check out all the episodes uh, aggregated into one page. Subscribe and download this episode on, on your favorite podcast app. Also, we have a lot of other content. We have a great YouTube channel, uh, YouTube forward slash gearscout. We got a couple shows on there, uh, the Gear Scout Guide and, and hosted by yours truly, The Download, uh, where we review you know, new guns, new gear, new tactical kit. I have a great new video up there on the standard USA Atlas uh, appendix inside the waistband holster. That's a fun one. We got some other great content coming your way, so be sure to uh, check that all out. And again, thanks for joining us. And until next week, this is the Gear Scout podcast, where if you wear it or carry it, we cover it. And uh, we'll see you soon.